Hey up guys, it's Rory from Enlighten the Shadows. Today is episode 10. We're in double figures. Uh, first time for Enlighten the Shadows. So it means we're still chipping away at what we're doing and we're not going anywhere, but we're bringing to you weekly episodes. Uh, last week we had um, episode nine, which was with one of my new work colleagues, Danny Cherie, and he talked about resilience and he had such a tough upbringing. So I'm just gonna put that on the screen right now for you guys. Uh, check that out after this episode with my guest today. Um, that will really inspire you. I just want to say to you guys, if you're struggling, you're feeling a little bit low, um, you're thinking of like things of life and you're just wondering, I can't be bothered about my job, I can't be bothered to get up in the morning, well, check out episode nine because it will really inspire you to say, actually, at the end of the day, we don't compare to everyone else's struggles, but what we can say is if another person has struggled massively and they can overcome with their resilience and prove themselves, so can you guys. So check that out as I say, but without further ado, I've got one of my closest mates on my show today. Um, the guy has been through utter hell, like me this past year, um, and he's been in a real dark time, and I think it would have been unfair to bring him on, but the guy's just starting to climb back up now, as I am, guys. So um, this man I've known for about seven years now, and we've been through some amazing times together. He's been there, he's had my back, and he's a now a registered learned disability nurse. And so he's got a lot to give to you guys tonight. So I want you to turn off the distractions um, and just plug in to what he's trying to say, because this guy's no nonsense. You know, I bring people from all plethoras of life, but this guy is going to see how it is. So without any pressure, hey up, Rich, mate, how you doing? Hey up, guys, you're all right. Um, yeah, good. Nice good. one, bud. You having a good week, mate? Yeah, great week, thank you. Um, yeah. I've got some well-deserved time off work and enjoying it and catching up with loads of stuff and uh, just plowing on. I'm doing loads of exercise this week, so. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so just uh, smashing out those uh, rings on my Apple Watch, so. Hey up, hey up, let's get them all. Where are they? <laughs> Here's mine. What we say, what we say, Rich? Oh, I just took my watch off, mate. Oh, uh, look. Let me look, let me look. Quick, quick, I'm, quick. Having, a good, I'm having a good day, bud. Oh, look. Oh, we have it. Oh, you are overlapping. Oh, do you know what? Put put the phone down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put it down. Stop shaming yeah, me. Yeah, twenty eight with... calories. You know your double rings. Yeah, just come around twice. <laughs> I've been sat in training most of the day, so that's my excuse. <laughs> yeah, any excuses? <laughs> oh, it's class, mate. Well, it's good to have you on the show, mate. Good to have you on. Yeah, good to be here as well. Nice one. Um, so yeah, man, I just wanted to. Um, take a journey throughout your life really because I feel like you've had a um, pretty hard deal handed to you in life that's you know not um, yeah. play it off softer you've had a, you've had a tough start to life and I know a lot of your story but what the people plugging in tonight's episode 10 don't know and that's the fact of all those trials and all those things you've been through makes you the man you are today and I believe um, as we go through tonight in the next hour that you're going to just bring some cool stuff and some real good um, inspirational words, I, I think. So without any putting pressure on you sort of thing, mate. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. No, not at all. Um, so yeah, just I want to um, talk about a couple of setbacks, if you don't mind talking about, just in your earlier life. Um, and I do this a lot, my guests. I like to go back in time because it does paint a picture and set the scene a lot with the person they are today. So it gives a a bit of perspective for people so yeah um i don't know you know you you fire away bro just tell people about your upbringing where you where you're from yeah. where you grew up and <laughs> what were those setbacks that happened as a, as a young yeah. lad yeah that's cool yeah so um yeah born and bred in uh sunny scunny um just outside sunny scunny in north lincolnshire um i i personally feel like i had quite a good upbringing as a child like i had a mum and dad that absolutely loved and worshipped us as children and like my mum I was really fortunate because my mum actually didn't work while we were growing up so it was that nice time like where we got dedicated mum time and um, which you know I couldn't have wished for a better mum to kind of do that and, and bring us up and just like the happy memories that I've got of that childhood but um, I, for I forgot I forgot that she 
um, didn't work when you were a youth because yeah. when the years that I saw her, like she was a hustler, she worked really hard and doing the deliveries. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, up until kind of the 2000, she kind of didn't work apart from uh, she used to do the odd like half day at school where she would come in and, and work as a teaching assistant. So, like, we'd always have her in the school holidays, we'd always have mum around and that that was really happy sort of memories. Um, I suppose one of my setbacks, I suppose, and it isn't a setback, but it, it has a knock-on effect to how kind of my journey with life went, was my dad was actually quite a lot older than my mum. So my dad was 27 years older than my mum, which uh, growing up as a child, that was kind of a bit of a, like a thing at school, like people would absolutely take the Michael out of me for okay. having of that. Okay. Um, yeah, and it had its knock-on effects because yeah. then you, you fall into that capture of getting bullied for, for your dad oh, yeah. being an older man. But um, my dad always used to say, though, that he enjoyed his time more with me and my sister growing up than oh, yeah. he did his kids um, from his previous marriage. So Not that he has favourites. No, no. <laughs> He always used to say like he'd got more time to give us when he was yeah. older because he had less like worries through life. And yeah, yeah. so I, I think that kind of helped as well because my dad had like time for us. So when he wasn't at work and that, he always had time to give to us. Um, and just, I think because he was older, he knew that he had to give more quality time when we were younger because he knew that going older, we wouldn't have a dad around. Yeah. So I always have like really happy sort of childhood memories growing up. Um, up until about the age of 10, 11, that's kind of when the first sort of trauma came into my life. So um, at that age, my mum was diagnosed with breast cancer. Right. So yeah, that was quite a, quite a devastating thing to go through. So my mum was 38 when she was diagnosed with breast cancer. So that's a young age to have breast cancer. And then to have two youngish children um, was even harder, I suppose, for her because mm. She would go through that worry of, you know, will she survive it? Won't she survive it? Yeah, man. Um, and that's kind of where I ended up becoming sort of a caregiver, I suppose, because not naturally, like at that age, you should be growing and developing yourself and people should be caring for you. Yeah. Um, but I just kind of switched roles quite quickly and like get in from school and cook a meal and just learn those basic skills like how to clean the house and things like that. that Is that why you're so good at cooking? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they're not the sort of skills that you would normally have no. at that. You would normally learn those later on in life where I suppose I had to kind of up my game and become this mm -hmm. like sort of caregiver. Um, I suppose that that's the best example to kind of give of it is a, is a caregiver because you're actually taking on that role what a parent, an adult should be doing, but you're doing that as a child. So yeah, that was the first kind of trauma and like I went through nights where I just wouldn't sleep. I'd be up most of the night. I yeah. biggest fear that I used to have was that I would wake up and my mum would be gone. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And it sounds daft now because like she wouldn't have just died in the night. It's kind of yeah. yeah. At that time, I used to always be like, "Mum was not going to be there when I wake up," so I used to stay awake like all yeah, night, yeah. every night. I, I, do you find it like you're? If your mum died as a young lad, it would be like way worse, like more severe than if your dad did. I always found that if my mum died, which my mum died almost did as well as a, as a late, late teenager. Yeah. Um, I don't know, as lads, we might be anomalies, but I feel like we have that in common just from talking to you tonight about this a bit more. because We've not really spoke about it in this way. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I feel like for young lads, like, I don't know, it's that like mummy boy syndrome. I don't know what it is. Yeah. So I think like no matter what, like as a, as a child, you always need your mum, like especially as a, a boy, like your mum's the ones you go to for your hugs and that and dads yeah, are the yeah. ones that are kind of the, take you for the play around on the park and things. So I, I think naturally if your mum's going to be taken from you at a young age or potentially could be taken from you at a young age, it has more of that knock on effect because yeah, yeah. like prime nine times out of ten they're the main caregiver so they're the ones that you've grown up with they're the ones you've got your bond with where dads kind of come in and like i said play the football and stuff and they're not naturally always the caregiver so i think that does have a sort of a knock-on effect and yeah. it's i found it to be more traumatic got you going through that 
then what what happens with your dad then eventually because like he 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 was yeah. older wasn't he so yeah well so there's a, there's a little bit of a gap oh, well there's a bit of a gap between sort of my mum getting cancer and then eventually my dad died in 2004 but in between that i had a my mum had a a son um I was a bit older than me and my sister um, and he died in 1999 at the age of 25 so yeah. mum had just got over her breast cancer um, she'd just like kind of started to go into the remission stage of that in 1999 they were still doing some like um, drug trialing with her and things like that but she was out of the the worst bit of it and was building up her life again um, she started to go back to work. That's when the parcels started to come into her life. So she used to deliver parcels um, for a job. And mate, she before sorry to cut you off. She's a baller. She knew. She knew. Like now, delivering parcels is is yeah. the in thing. Like loads of people do it. They're yeah. self-employed and get a quid per package. Your mum was ahead of her time, bro. Yeah. So that happened in 1999. So my brother died. Um, a mother traumatic thing. So. You don't expect to get a knock. I always remember it because Children in Need was on that night and I was sat watching it with my mum and we got a knock on the door and it was the police to say that my brother had died in a car accident and um, then we had to go identify his body and all that and that was another sort of big traumatic thing because you don't expect to get that knock on the door and tell you that your 25-year-old brother's died. Mm. And the most traumatic thing I think for that was none of us knew that he was actually coming home. So he'd been working away and then he drove back from Kent um, and, and died on the A15. And no, none of us actually knew he was coming home that weekend. And he kind of had planned it to come and like surprise everybody, like, oh, I'm home. Yeah. And uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't far away, was he? Like, yeah. well, you've shown me the site, and that's yeah. like 10, 15 minutes from your house. Yeah. So, yeah, that was a mother traumatic thing. And, and and through that, I suppose, like, I, I was a bit older then. I was at comp school, so I was second year at comp. So, like, you're in that different uh, sort of age category then. And, and that, the grieving process for that was really, really difficult because naturally I wanted to go back to school, wanted to be around people. But the coping of that was quite hard because nobody actually understood what you was going through and how you felt and and to cope with that at school was quite a difficult time it's a lot like that isn't it for anyone i guess with yeah. grief when you lose someone and you're surrounded by mates or loved ones and this is for the viewers yeah. as well like grief is one of the hardest things to support people with because there's freaking nothing you can say so that's going to change out you know and anything you do say is a bit like oh shoot maybe i should have said that even though i'm trying to help them and support them yeah. so yeah and yeah that that, that wasn't I, I don't i find that the death of my brother wasn't as bad as possibly my mum getting cancer in, in in the way that i dealt with the trauma i think it was easier to grieve and not get over but it was easier to grieve and get past that hurdle in life than it was my mum having cancer do you know what I do? You know what I like that like you're talking like tonight is the language that you're using. And I say to the viewers, um, episode seven was with Doctor uh, Thoraya, and she's a psychologist that came on our show, and she talked about um, trauma, which is associated leading up factors to ill mental health for fellows and, and and women as well, and children. And we have these um, adverse childhood experiences that are trauma. And a lot of us blokes just block out and go, oh, yeah, it wasn't that bad. Or, oh, you know, yeah, yeah, that happened, but it wasn't so bad. And so they minimalize it, they ignore it, or they, you know, project that trauma away. But you're actually using the language, which I really want to say, nice one, bro, because a lot of people play the big man card and go, yeah, 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 it's, uh, no, that's nothing. And they try and say that someone else's life was a lot worse. It's like, well, you're discarding like something that a child, you know, shouldn't necessarily have to go through but yeah yeah and then so after my brother died we, you know we had a, quite a few good years and then in 2004 my dad um was took seriously ill with pneumonia and i've already said that my dad was a lot older than my mum so my dad was now in his 70s um at that, that time and um 
so he went into hospital, um, started some antibiotics for pneumonia, was looking like it was going to clear up his chest infection, no problems. Um, I was at college at that time studying to be a chef. Um, and then in the night, my mum stayed with him that, like one of the nights because my dad actually had a stroke in the daytime. Um, and in the night, the bleed on the brain actually, so it exploded basically. Um, I started to consume so the bleeding on the brain, started to like bleed into all the, the areas of the brain. So he went to a coma. Um, and then the next day, we, yeah, unfortunately, passed away. Well, so. there's no wonder, flipping out. I didn't know that that's what happened to him. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, um, yeah, so went in with pneumonia and died of a stroke, basically. Um, How did you deal with that? Um, because I think I remember the way you said about the way you dealt with this. And this is, this is like classic bloke male syndrome. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so this one, um, I just kind of got on with life. Um, so my mum obviously was devastated. The love of her life had passed away. Um, and obviously I then had to step up and um, be the man around the house. So it was kind of having to step up the plate and, you know, look after her, make sure that she was okay. And to some extent, put my own sort of dreams and aspirations on hold um, through that. So I said I was at college training to be a chef and, um previous to that I'd actually been offered a job working in the Lake District, um a, a really nice hotel. And um because my dad had took seriously ill in the summer, I actually gave that job up uh, and decided I was gonna stay on at college instead of going to work there. So I kind of put my own dreams to one side yeah. and I just went into, you know, I must stay at home, got to look after mum and and not not that I should I shouldn't have done that. I, I think that showed a good sort of character of myself that actually, you know, despite all that, I was willing to kind of support my mum through a really hard, difficult time. And and even to the extent where, so my mum was self-employed, so she wasn't working at the time. So like even money struggles were hard because we wasn't a rich family and we never had loads of money. So um, just having having to like make sure that things were a bit tight around the house and, making sure that there was food on the table and things like that. So, um, and there was like me and my sister and my mum left. So we had to become like a small little family unit of all three of us working, yeah. together, supporting each other and getting, getting through it. Um, and through that, I suppose I didn't allow that grieving process to really kick in. Um, Tricky, isn't it? Because you like, did, you did an honourable thing. You did what most blokes would do or young men, you step up to the plate and, you know, us saying like in the shadows, proper condone that. It's like, yeah, be a man, take ownership. We have an acronym, ACT, ACT. The T is take ownership, take control. Um, and you did that and that's absolutely class, but it's like, it's almost like the ACT knowledge and the comprehend bit, you just kind of yeah. just went, out of the way, right, bang, I need, I, I've got a job to do. And that's, that's the way men are wired, aren't we? Like, yeah. there's a lot of science biologically, the way we're wired, we're very task and mission goal orientated, whereas women are a lot more empathetic, a lot more nurturing. So, yeah, totally understandable, isn't it? But, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. So, that kind of, yeah. So, life just plodded on like normal then. Um, and it was about... Mm, 2000 I'm just trying to think when we went to across Europe and stuff uh, that's 2013 I think I think it might I think it was 2014 yeah well tell the viewers before you get to that tell the viewers how how we met <laughs> <laughs> so with our man <laughs> uh, so I had um, so I stayed as a chef basically um, yeah working um in hotels and, and pubs and stuff and then in 2012 i decided i was going to go and work in a care home for people with learning disabilities as a chef so i went and did that um and then in 
2013, they decided they were going to make us all redundant <laughs> as the chefs. So I had to make a quick sort of career choice then. Like, what was I going to do? Was I going to go back into hotels? Was I going to stay sort of in the care sector? Um, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I got offered the opportunity to become a support worker and um, big pay cut. But I decided I was going to take that opportunity just to have like a complete and utter I, I just I was going to do it as a break from being a chef I was like I'll just have a, a year out kind of set my stall out see where I want to go again uh, with this potentially I was looking at like going in to um, do my own sort of like tea room or something like that so opening up like a little tea room do nice cakes and stuff like that and um, fell in love with my support worker job absolutely just loved it. I loved the fact that I was actually making a change to people's lives and and doing some great sort of stuff with that. And then I got um, I got a lovely invite to go to Nottingham. So I'm still working in Scunthorpe, and uh, they offered me the opportunity to go to Nottingham to one of our sister hospitals. Um, and that's when I met Rory. Um, that's right. So we had some very interesting shifts there. Let's put it like that. Um, no, I can't, you can't tease the, the viewers like that. <laughs> tell, them, tell them that we got put on a two-to-one what happened, because it was sick. Uh, <laughs> well, it so, was literally sick as in gruesome, not sick because it was yeah. good. <laughs> so me and Rory got put with this patient. He's two-to-one, one of the most challenging patients I've ever, to this day, come across. Um, tell, them, tell them the kind of behaviours before you tell them what he did that day and what made it so bonded us. What so, did he do? So people have that idea. Because a lot of people watching, they don't, they don't even know that. It's not their fault, but they don't know that these people exist almost like, and what they do. So We definitely do. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, <man. laughs> so this uh, young gentleman, he used to display behaviours such as slapping, uh, punching, smashing windows, kicking running, absconding, spitting, biting. <laughs> Is that about it? I think that's about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, we'll give him credit. He was a nice lad. He was when he was calm. Yeah. But Great personality him. when he was settled. Yeah. Class and class, but... To this day, we had a, a, a great morning with him. Like, he was up, we gave him a little foot massage in the morning. I always remember that because he was like, he was buzzing. He was in such a great place. Um got to about lunchtime and then he realised that I was actually from his hometown um, and he, he got really fixated on it. I, would, I remember that happening and he just wouldn't, he was relentless with that and just wouldn't let up on the fact that I was from where he'd grown up. Um, and I, I don't even know how we got to this bit, but I just remember we were stood there talking to him and the next thing, he, he hawked up the biggest phlegm ball I can ever... <laughs> remember and he spat it straight at you and just as he was about to say it you opened your mouth to go don't you dare spit and it landed straight in that mouth of yours right here right just above my lip just there right on the <laughs> bottom of my tash it's, it still scars me it still scars me. <laughs> <laughs> i almost was like had a full shave like no tash uh, not that you were bothered by it or anything mate to be fair I took it like Carl Frotch on the chin because it, it was a luminous green because he took meds, bless him. It was freaking minging. It was just like there, like, and I was just like, <laughs> wow. But yeah, man, that's how, that's how we connected. And we just like yeah. got on like house on fire that day. We had a right good shift together. And then we just, you know, you were you and I was me and we just clicked, didn't we, mate? Yeah, it was, I think for me, it was, the bit that made me click was I'd actually found somebody that I actually could talk to and gel with and not feel judged. I think that was the biggest thing for me. Um, and that you could have, I, like, I used to have really good laughs with you and stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, bless you, bro. I appreciate the uh, kind words. Cause that's what I want in like the shadows to be for people. Yeah. It's like, you know, we've got Paolo. We're going to talk about him as well. Like coming on board with a team and like, giving his edge of it with the social media and having um, three weekly sessions with him and having banter and stuff like that way. But at the same time, we want to be known as people who 
don't only have fun, but we don't judge people and that, you know, we're getting the right info across so that people who are struggling the other side of the screen and people listen to your amazing stuff today, mate, that, you know, it's not all, there's, there's banter everywhere. You yeah. go to the pub, there's banter all day long. So, yeah. So, so yeah, so that's how we met. And then um, we went for a, a crazy, I don't know if it was the road trip or if it was before that. I think it might have been when we came back from Sunderland. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so we were in Sunderland for a little jolly. Um, I just kind of started to talk about my dad, I believe. I can't really remember how it came up, but yeah. I talked to you about my dad and and then that was it. I started to grieve for the first time in sort of 10 years. Um and that was a crazy, a crazy roller coaster of emotions and and a bit of guilt, I suppose, with that as well, that I hadn't grieved properly for him to begin with. I felt like that showed that I didn't I suppose I felt like it showed to people that I didn't love him, which I did love him, but because I hadn't grieved, I felt like people felt like I didn't love him. Isn't that weird that we think so much? We have like these misconceptions and these fears and doubts about things. And yeah. it's like completely irrelevant about what other people think. This is like your connection with your father. This is your grief. It's not anyone else's to own or have an opinion about. But yet we allow the, uh, the conscious mind to like grab hold of it. And it just gets in the way of us, doesn't it? Like yeah, totally. It's crazy, isn't it? Why can't we just have yeah. this mind that stops overthinking? I had training today, mental resilience training at work. And it was all about this. It was about the conscious mind overthinking things rather than the subconscious and the brain just going and, and just being on task. And we can't live in the now, which is what in like the shadows is all about, is mindfulness, which is now, not what happened then not what they think just this now and our brain just stops it doesn't it it's the same with your grief yeah mad so so yeah so then i then i grieved for my dad which was like the best thing that ever happened like just to hey, oh, someone's there Hey, oh. Do you know what? Last week we had with Danny, Danny Sheree. He was telling his missus, no, no, no. Then they've got a dog this week. It's meant. <laughs> Just keep speaking. We'll be all right. So, yeah. So then I ended up grieving for my dad. Um... <laughs> it's all right. Keep going. He wants to be part of the show. I know. So, um, yeah. I don't know kind of where I'm going with this now. Um, so, grieve for my dad. And then the most amazing sort of bit of my journey kind of started to happen it was when I then applied for uni oh yeah because what what do you struggle with in terms of like applications and pushing yourself educationally wise and writing things up so um yeah unfortunately I've got the the lovely diagnosis of dyslexia yeah yeah so um I'm so I'm quite fortunate with my dyslexia that it's not it's not a bad form of dyslexia. Like I can cope with it and I can get through everyday life with it. But when I go into academic mode, um, I really struggle. Like yeah, to put pen to paper sometimes is like the hardest thing for me. Um, only because it's an uphill struggle and it's not because I can't do it. It's because that mindset kicks in. Oh, this is going to be hard. It's going to be a challenge. And actually once my mind's in there it's, yeah, yeah. it's not a challenge but does that did it put you off like going uni level um totally so i did an access to higher education um before i went to uni and um, to get into uni and all the way through that i was like i'm gonna really struggle with this i'm not gonna be able to do it and like i was getting distinctions for that every time I did like because I applied myself to it and I think because I had that passion and that drive that I wanted to go and do my nursing like that helped me I had to stay focused on it and there was times when I would be like I can't do this assignment like especially biology that was the hardest subject for me because it is all about reading the textbook and then rewriting the textbook in your own words oh yeah um and like the spellings of stuff is like crazy spellings for biology. Like some of the words are like so long and 
I, I really struggle with that. But I pushed through and I, I got distinctions for a lot of my biology stuff because because I struggled with it, I had to try harder. So I had to apply myself more to it. Come on. So, Inspire those viewers, bro. Tell them, tell them, tell them to do the same. Yeah, well, that's it. It's, it like, even when I got to uni, so the first year at uni was, I was quite like, that was my easiest year. Because well, hold on a minute. You can't go to the first year. You tell them about your application process because they got to know. Because most people would have just gone, ah, forget that. I'm not doing this. Come on, uh, tell, tell them what happened. Forget, see, I forget about this this bit because it's like, it, it's done, in it? It's, I got in. So I applied for the story. So I applied for my nursing and automatically like there is only I think it's like there's 80 places for learning disability nurses across the whole country uh, every year for an intake at uni and they only run it at six unis across the UK so one's Teesside, one's Birmingham, one's Hull, Nottingham and Leicester so I applied for all those I can't remember I think the other one's like down in London or something. So I applied for all those unis and um, the first interview I got was at Teesside. Went, did it, got in, didn't like the uni though cause, and, and it was the wrong direction from where I wanted to be. Mm-hmm. Um, the next one was Hull, uh, which was fine. That was up the road from where my mum lived. Not an issue with that. Uh, then I did an interview at Leicester um, and got in at Leicester. So, so far it was like I'd gotten all three, but my heart was set on Nottingham. And the reason I chose Nottingham as like my top one was because it is renowned for learning disability nursing through the whole of the UK. Like there's some lecturers there that have been learning disability nurses. Uh, there's one in particular, Helen Laverty, and she focuses and, and pushes the drive for learning disability nurses. So what her aim is, is to get student nurses, nurture them, and then send them out to be like yeah, spokesperson. Massive and to drive a way forward for the care for people with learning disabilities. So yeah. um, definitely wanted to get in at Nottingham. Yeah, man. Um, Birmingham Uni, I didn't even go for the interview because I was like, I don't want to go to Birmingham. <laughs> I just didn't, didn't want to do it. Didn't want to do it. <laughs> My wife, Sheree, she, she went to Birmingham. But we weren't... Don't say no more, say no more. <laughs> um, so Nottingham, I um, didn't even get in, in, invited for interview. Um, which was like devastating and I always remember I, I was at work and I received this email and I, I sat in the dining room at work and I just started crying and I was like they rejected me they didn't even interviewed me <laughs> like yeah. they don't want me um, so that night I was like right I'm not having this that's my uni I want to go to and that's my right. top, top now, pa- I need to pause you there because this is a bit this is a crucial this is a crucial turning point and there's a lot of people that need to hear this, right? Because you're, you're telling the story beautifully. And I'm sorry to be rude, but you, 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 you're telling it. But there is a crucial element here. You said, right, I decided to... So before you tell us about what you decided to do, you've clearly made a decision, haven't you? Talk, talk to the viewers about this because you've just described, right, this is my heart and soul. I had all my dreams, aspirations set for Nottingham. I wasn't going anywhere else, right? So you got that. You've just explained the importance of, of why Nottingham, because of the location and ultimately the, how excellent they are for learning disability and nurturing the, the profession. Then you've been told you've been absolutely pied, not even giving them a chance. And then you're like, I was devastated. I was even crying. So as a fully grown bloke to cry. That, it clearly had a freaking massive impact on you. So why didn't you give up? Because that's where I wanted to go, and that was my aim, and and I knew that that's where I should be at uni. Um, uh, yeah. But they told you no, bro. So, but why would I give up on a dream and an aspiration? There we go. Hey, you watching this today? Wherever you are, whatever country, time zone, day or night, morning, there you have it. Why should, why should you be stopped for a gene aspiration that you have, guys? So I want to speak to you viewers right now before we carry on. If you get told no once, like Rich did, don't allow that. Rich, what did you do? 
So I went home, compiled a lovely email to <laughs> to the University of Nottingham. And I can't remember what I put in the email, but I was basically like, I be- I was begging them. And I was like, and I remember I put in it. So you've you've judged me for basically, but you've interviewed me, but you've made a judgment that I'm not suitable for your university, even though you haven't interviewed me. Um, so I remember putting that. Um, because I'm a Christian, I remember I I spoke to a lot of my Christian friends and I asked them to pray for it. That's right. Um, changed. We did that. Yeah. Um, and I just believed that I, I believe that they would ask me for an interview at some point. Come on. And the next day, I was I always remember this because I was working the next day and I was like I was talking to somebody at work and I was like, oh, I didn't get in at Nottingham. They rejected my application really wanted to go to Nottingham, blah, blah, blah. I kept going on about it. I think everybody at work must have heard my tale of woe that day. Um, and at about five o'clock, I went on my, like a break and I thought, oh, I'll just check my phone and see if I've had any emails from any of the unis and stuff. And obviously it goes through UCAS, so you have to then log into your UCAS account. And all I'd got an email saying was, uh, there's a, a an update on your U, UCAS account. And I was like, oh, I'm probably one of the unis that's accepting my offer. Uh, giving me an offer of acceptance and they'll probably be chasing some info yeah they logged back in that night and there was a letter from the university of nottingham apologizing come on saying that basically that my application had, had slipped by the net um and it shouldn't have been rejected it should have been they basically clicked the wrong button on the ucas thing See? It should have been accepted uh for interview uh with an interview date and I went for the interview and within 40 minutes of driving back up the road, I got an email to say that I'd been accepted at Nottingham. Smashed it out of the park. Boom. So. Mistakes happen, guys. We had, we had, you know, even at my current job role, um, we had a couple of the, of the lads being told no. And then um, them kindly go, oh, wait, so, we're really sorry I made a mistake. This, this is the point. Yeah. Some, Just, sometimes human nature, you've you got to push. You've got a push through push until something happens just don't give up on it that's my best bit of advice i could give anybody with that is don't ever give up like times will be hard with it and times will be really challenging like that was the most devastating bit of news that i in my head i'd got my whole life planned out for living in nottingham i was like i'm gonna move to nottingham i'd got my new church sorted <laughs> i'd got my friendship circle <laughs> sorted yeah. And then to think, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to go to Hull. <laughs> it won't look, look, we don't hate Hull. Hull, Hull is Hull, but uh, what we'll say is we prefer Nottingham. So, And Mo Timbo, one of our guests for episode uh, six, I believe it was, he, he, you know, he does a great knife crying work and he's got a church in Hull. So Mo, if you're watching, you may not be, because I know you're doing up your new building. Well done on that. You've got nothing against Hull, bro. <laughs> Just had to clear that up officially live. So yeah, so I knocked on that door and I got in, basically. Come on. Um, Come on. So you was just this guy doing basic college courses, got into a bit of cooking, you, you were a chef, then you became a learning disability support worker and it became clear to you, like, your passions and your goals and any aspirations. And, you know, then you, you're like, right, I want to be a, a registered learning disability nurse. And then you just overcome the biggest fat no in your life. And then you've got dyslexia, you're, you know, high education here, doing degree. Did you get your degree or not? Yeah, I got my, I got my degree. Yes, lad, well done. Uh, through some very, very hard times at uni. Um, but like that, I didn't give up. I was always better at the practical side. So I would shine in my practical skills um, I would make sure my placements were always the best. That would counteract to the, the fact that my academic work wasn't always at the same high standard. Um, the two balance each other out. So I suppose what I'm, what I'm saying is no matter what, like even though I've got an issue with dyslexia, is don't give up. Like if I can go get a degree, anybody can go get a degree. Oh, come on, fire. And no matter what, how old you are either. Because um, weren't there people on your course that were... I've got people on my course that were like in the 40s. Um, yeah. One of the 
one of the lecturers, I think she said that there was a, a woman in her 50s that passed the course once. You know, like, just go, go do it. Go, like, if there's a dream or aspiration that you want, go do it. That's what I would say to it, is just go try it. Go knock on that door, push yourself into it. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. What have you lost from it? You've, you've followed your heart and you've followed your dreams. Sitting on, smashing it. So you uh, became a registered nurse from getting your degree, right? Yeah. Um, you started the nursing. Can you just take us on your mad couple of years about how people couldn't understand how quickly you, you know, climbed? And just, just, you know, that determination and, yeah, you know, how, how you excelled yourself and what disciplines you had to excel yourself. So can you take us through that story? Because it's, it's freaking brilliant. Yeah. I suppose one of the things I do need like, to start it off with was I actually had to take a job where I didn't necessarily want to kind of go back to. So I love the place. I did a placement there, um, but I went back to li- live in Lincolnshire um as opposed to nottingham um so i'd spoke earlier about my mum having a diagnosis of cancer so the year i qualified so this had a mother knock-on effect while i was at uni so the year my mum qualified the year i qualified as a registered nurse my mum got diagnosed when i was in my last management placement with terminal cancer untreatable um and she was like literally given I, i don't know at the time they kind of said you know it could be years it could be months um to live um so i took this job back in lincolnshire didn't really want to go do it um i don't know if you remember like i applied everywhere for jobs um because i didn't know where i wanted to live i didn't know what i wanted to do um i knew at some point i wanted to be back in nottingham um so i started as a registered nurse um and that was my official sort of job title um so the company I went to work for didn't really have any designations of, of like ranks and stuff at that time. So yeah. I went in as a registered nurse, but on a very, very good salary. Um, so I was getting paid sort of equivalent to a band six in the NHS, which is crazy as a newly qualified nurse. Um, and then I had been doing it sort of nine, I think it was nine months into it. And I was offered the opportunity to go and interview for a job in the NHS, which I did. And I got that. And that was for a community nursing post at Band 6. Um, but at the same time, I I took um, an interview at work for a charge nurse post, which was like a massive leap from being a sort of a staff nurse to a charge nurse <laughs> overnight. So the place where I work, we have char- uh, we have staff nurses and senior staff nurses and then charge nurses. Um, so I missed out the senior staff nurse bit and just jumped straight in as a charge nurse. Um, got offered that job at interview. So got offered it that day, uh, accepted it straight away cool. and took this massive like jump up the ladder. Um, looking back now, would I have done done the same? Yeah, because I love my job and I have a passion and a drive for my job. Um, was I inexperienced to do it? No. I was working my backside off to, to, to get to that level. I was pushing myself. Um, and I was always stepping out. So uh, we do a thing as a registered nurse called revalidation. And I've just literally completed that this week. Um, so every three years we have to like log on our um, clinical skills and development that we've done. Yeah. And, I looked back and I was like, oh my gosh, I was doing like every single training course that I could think of. Like I did everything, <laughs> anything that threw at me. I was like, I'll do that. I'll do that. What, uh, what, what made you want to take all that on? What was your mindset and how, how did you become so disciplined and like made yourself to excel at that level? Cause you clearly just got mad promotions quick and that's yeah. not normal. So can like, you just enlighten our viewers with like a bit of, just inspiration um, clearly just gone levels so i when i started the job i worked with a lot of different nurses from different backgrounds and i'd always kind of thought to myself that i, I don't want to just be an everyday nurse i, I don't want to do that i want to set myself out i want to be an inspiration to other people i i wanted to to make sure that no matter what I did, 
I could go home and sleep at night knowing that I'd delivered the best possible care for my patients and that if I'd got students working alongside me that I would give them the best opportunity and experience that they could have to learn and develop. Um, and I suppose that passion and drive came from, I just, I, I set out, I wanted, I, like I said, I wanted to be excellent at my job. Um, and no matter what, I would have pushed myself to have done that. So if it meant staying up every night to read some coursework to, to progress, I would have done that at that time. Um, and never taking your eye off the ball. Like mm. somebody once said to me that I was set to be a manager. They were like, do you have got the skills and the enthusiasm and drive to lead people? And I think that was where it all came from was I want to be that person. I want to be that person that inspires and leads other people to be That's the meant. they can be in their career. But you, you know, you had to make those sacrifices. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. you had to make that choice. And we want to say to the viewers, like, if you want to go and get something rich said and, you know, push yourself or go study or get a, a new career and all this, like, yeah, you've got to do it, but th it might come with some sacrifices as well. So we just want to say to you, like, things in life don't come easy. Like this YouTube channel is early days. Like I've only got 50 subscribers and we asked you today, subscribe, <laughs> please, <laughs> you know, and keep watching and share, share these videos far and wide. But the, the, the key is I ain't going anywhere. We keep on pushing this information to help men's mental health and mindfulness. And that's what Rich is saying tonight to you guys. Like it comes with a sacrifice. Like I've just started my new job the last three or four weeks and I'm absolutely shattered, but it comes with a cost. It's a sacrifice. If you want to excel yourself, push yourself like Rich did, you've got to have some sacrifices. So yeah, man, love it. So, so then I didn't, I didn't give up though then. So I had been a charge nurse for uh, about a month and nine months. I did charge nurse for, and uh, I was given the opportunity to go and work with. Um, so the company I work for, we have like a turnaround team. So I was given the opportunity to go and do a secondment. So that's when we go out and we'll step out of our job role, go do something different. And then obviously you've got the opportunity to return back to your job that you was in. So I went and did some work with the regional team um, and set myself out and um, and basically went into a, a service that wasn't doing too well. And the best bit of, that I ever got from that was, um, and I, I just I, I put that in my revalidation this week as well. It's really funny that I've been reading back on all this stuff was I, I received a card from all and it was saying, thank you for the enthusiasm and drive that you brought to the team. You were, you were an amazing role model and you brought change to the service. And I, I read that and I thought, do you know what? Like, I only did that for a month, but I must have touched so many people during that time, like patients Impact. that, you know, how, how what my little planting of a seed has done, you know, could be instrumental to some people. Just going in there and being enthusiastic. I remember the staff team were burnt out, they were tired, they were exhausted, and just being happy and cheerful around them, it had an impact. Absolutely, mate. We've got two choices in life. Yeah, definitely. You know, which path are we going to take? And we again, back to my training today, um, we talked about the things you control and the things you can't control. And literally... We listed so many things, but it's like, can you control it a hundred percent, no matter what? And it's like the only thing you can control in your life fully is how you react to things. Yeah, totally. That's it. Everything else you actually can't one hundred percent. It's and it's um, a famous um, Holocaust survivor said that took away all human rights in the camps. That he said the only power or, or thing he had full control of is still that 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 the Nazis couldn't take was his reaction to what they did to him. And it was your, you know, it's your reaction here. It's your reaction to go, ah, oh, no, nah, I don't know much. No, nah, I've just come out of uni. I'll just stay as a, a regular staff nurse. So, so when I'd done the secondment, I then thought, do you know what? I'm going to knock on a mother door here. Hey, up. So I, um, didn't return back as a charge nurse. I went to be the nurse manager for the residential services on the site where I was working as the charge nurse. Um, so I took another promotion at work. Come on. 
Um, and I always remember this, my first day at work doing that job, the first thing that somebody said to me was, I don't know how you've got that job because you're too inexperienced. And I was like, I'm going to flip and show you now how inexperienced I am not. And I went in there and I, I started some work with that service and, and it helped to start to turn it around. And I never gave up on my passion and drive for that. Um, realized quickly it wasn't the job for me. Yeah. No, I did it for four months, but within that four months, I also went and did um, another, so I managed two services for two, two months of that, four months. Um, so I went to Barnsley and managed a service there while they were waiting for a manager to start. Um, and the only reason I stepped down from that job was it wasn't because I, I couldn't do it and I couldn't handle it, it was because I realised my passion isn't, isn't in an office. My passion mm -hmm. in private working clinically, supporting the staff team and supporting other nurses and delivering good quality patient care. And I'm not saying you can't do that in an office, but I realise that my gifting and skill mix is clinical. It's about being there with the patients, dealing with the situations, dealing with the everyday challenges. Um, and when I was working in the office, it kind of like dampened my fire. So... Mm -hmm. As soon as I came back out of that role and went back as a charge nurse, like my fire was like reset again. It was like somebody just flicked a switch again and I was like back to my normal, yeah, giving that drive and giving that passion. Um, and I never give up on my dreams. Like my dream is, is big. Like I want to one day be the, like the lecturers and like driving the way forward for learning disability care. But through that, I've had to realise that I've got to learn skills and develop myself along the way. And yeah. you can't always run before you can walk. Um, Ooh, say that again. You can't always run before you can walk. Hey, it's an old classic saying, but you know what? Just drop that in there tonight for the viewers. Love it. So sometimes you just have to reset yourself and pull yourself back. And actually, while... I was developing and, and becoming this nurse manager. Unfortunately, at the same time, my mum actually passed away from a terminal cancer. So it, it all kind of fell in at the right time um, mm -hmm. that I was going back, stepping back down to being a charge nurse. And I say stepping down, it wasn't a step back for me. It was actually realising something about myself and realising mm -hmm. that that's where I wanted to be with life. And I wanted that passion and that drive to be more around my clinical skills rather than operationally as a nurse. Oh, yeah. I'm still, I'm still got hopes and dreams and aspirations to yeah, still keep pressing on with that. And I will never give up on what I've chosen to do. Like my career is a big, big, big part of my life. And you know, like from being around me, like I give 110% to people who learn disability. I, I would never wash my hands on that even if times get hard and get tough i never give up on on that delivering that patient care and making sure that things are right and i think that's about it with careers is and and you're stepping out yourself at the moment into a new career but it is about never giving up and always looking for bigger opportunities within that so don't ever see a job as a dead-end job like you could be stacking shelves in tesco's but the people that you could be interacting with and engaging and you can make such a difference to some, one person's life. Massive. Like, Don't give up on your own dreams and aspirations. Like, We've all got different dreams and different aspirations in life, but it's about following it through, pushing on with it. Like, I never thought I would ever, ever get a uni degree. And I've got one of the best uni degrees in the world. Like, Nottingham University is renowned across the whole of the UK for being one of the best unis for nursing. Um, and I've got a 2-2 degree, which for somebody with dyslexia is amazing. That's mate. Absolutely brilliant. Mate, you're on fire, bro. You're just going on and spinning it on them. Love it. And that's the, uh, what I wanted to share as well with the viewers and to you, Rich, is like I see every interaction, every job, every person as a bit of scaffolding. So like I see the tapestry of our lives, like what we end up making of our lives is like a building or a beautiful architectural 
design and every single interaction every person is a building block every job is a is a floor and each floor you go up and i just i just say like uh, to the viewers just listen to what rich is saying it's massive because every part of your life makes that that infrastructure of who you are what your legacy is and ultimately we only get one shot here guys so you know take these these um, tips and advice that Rich has given, this inspiration, and, and apply it to your life. Act now. Acknowledge these things that you're going through. Think about them, so comprehend it, and take ownership. Go for it, because there's no time like now, and no one else is going to make you do it. You got to. You got to. What Rich is saying, you got to want it for yourself. He's got that desire. It's got to come within. Within, you know, you, you can have people encouraging you. Know, like of course, you can have you know, all of your motivational speeches, YouTube and TED Talks and books. At the end of the day, you've got to make that choice yourself. So make it. Woo, mate. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> but yeah. Um, it's true though. You've got to, if you, there's something you want in life, you've got, to, you've got to put your stall out and go for it. Full, hard hog. It's like, we all have had different dreams and different aspirations in life. I, I've worked with people, you know, that have wanted to be, I interviewed, actually I interviewed somebody and he, he really touched me in his interview because he was applying for an assistant psychologist post. And he said to me, when I interviewed him, he went, um, I don't want to, I don't want to become a psychologist. He says, I just want to be the best assistant psychologist I can ever be. You know, and we, it's like you said, we have all got different roles and purposes in life. Yeah, absolutely. Mate. Some of us will be the chief execs. Some of us will be sweeping floors. But, you know, we all bring a purpose and a meaning to different people and to our own Absolutely. life. Because there'll be people that are cleaner accesses that the CEOs will never see. So yeah. that's the point. We're all equal. And we've all got exposure and influence to make. So, yeah, man. Um, before we, we close, because I'm, I'm loving this today, um, I want to ask you one last question. And I... I come back and forth this question a lot. It's like the Enlighten the Shadows question um, that I ask at the end of each episode. Um, and, I, and I'm conscious I haven't done it for a, quite a few now. So I wanted to ask you tonight before we finish, you know, if, uh, uh, what's the best piece of advice for a bloke right now who literally is at their wits end and just feel completely hopeless and they just want to end it all? Can you just enlighten them with your bit of, of um, short advice? That'd be great, man. Um, I suppose my best bit of advice I could ever give anybody is just don't give up. Like, no matter what you're going through, just keep pressing into it. And you know, we all go through, we all go through difficult times. Like, life is never a, a bed of roses, as they say. You know, sometimes we'll get the sweet smelling rose. Sometimes we'll get a thorn stuck in us. When you get that thorn stuck in you, you've got to do something about it. Don't just sit there and, and ponder and and want to give up on it you've got to you've got to push through that and I think that's my kind of key and a bit of advice to everybody is just keep pressing into whatever you and don't see things as hurdles just keep pressing in and keep going and run the race of life like you know times have been hard I've I've had numerous issues in life where I, I could have given up um but just don't give up and you're still here yeah my Still, guy i suppose quickly just before i finish with this is life is a bit like a, a, a playing a, a game ugh, life is a bit like playing a, a game of cards sometimes you get dealt really good hands other times you get dealt bad hands but you've got to play the cards you've got because you don't know what your opponent's going to have oh it's like poker isn't it you both can have bob hands yeah and you've got to just go with it yeah and whatever you're given in life, you've got to just keep playing that card. Yeah, don't fold. If you fold, you ain't going to win. Come on. That's it. Pure fire. We're going to just drop it there and let them be served. You are <laughs> served and you are welcome. <laughs> oh, Rich, mate, it's been sick. Um, oh, buzzing. I'm glad, I'm glad we did that, bro. That was class. And um just before i say bye to you i just want to do my usual plug-in so guys if you've enjoyed this tonight and if you're about to watch episode nine as i said earlier with danny sheree it's about motivation and resilience 
crack onto that now. But before you do, I really want you to do this for me because this is massive. Me and Paolo now are, are, are smashing out. We're on the analytics. We're trying to get more clout. We want pushing in light in the shadows as far and wide. So come up on the screen right now is that big red button subscribe. If you press pause on this video and look below the video on YouTube, it will, it will give you the option to subscribe. Those who have already subscribed, much love. We love you. Appreciate you. Um, but keep watching this and get on that Facebook and share the granny out of these videos. Also, coming up on the screen right now, we've got Enlighten the Shadows on Twitter and Instagram. So I'm asking you guys, again, get on those bad boys. I know, I know you, some of you got it. So get on there. And the handle is at Enlighten the SH1. Please get on that and just join on the journey with us. We're really excited. As I said, Paolo Pinheiro, I've, I've referred to two or three times now. The guys want it to get on board voluntarily, just like I'm doing this all free of my own time. And we're just so passionate about um, providing a community and a platform for fellas. And if women are plugging in, amazing, that's great. And we welcome you. But our niche is for men and we want to improve the mental health and mindfulness, generally speaking. So guys, we appreciate your support, your following. If you made it so far, thank you so much. And guys, see you next time. Um, our next uh, video is going to be Paolo himself because we're going to get him on every three weeks. So special episode number three it is. Um, and he raised four grand for Mind, the charity. So the guy is just like Rich, he's full of fire and passion. So join us on that. And we've got some exciting stuff that we're going to come your way. We're going to have a bit of banter and stuff. So get on it. But guys, we love you so much. Have a good night and God bless. Thanks, Rich, mate. Nice one, bud. Take care. Cheers, mate. See you guys.